So I want to introduce uh, Dr. Michael Flom. Uh, Michael is uh, Professor Emeritus now in the Department of Psychiatry, but also the president of the American Association for Community Psychiatry. Um, Michael is going to uh, make a few comments, and uh, we'll kind of go from there. So, Michael? Well, thanks, Lance. And again, just uh, thank you so much for being here. It, it means a tremendous amount to us, and as I look around the room, you know, I see a lot of faces that have come to the table for a long time. And uh, I'm honored to be able to just make a few comments to sort of talk a little bit about the how and the why uh, that we got here. Um, and, you know, it, it is this, I think, really lovely collaboration of very solid state leadership and really a great local community process. And, you know, to me, it dates back, I was trying to think of when our first system of care meeting was. Do you guys remember? I think it was around 2009, 2010. And that was an important time for both local and state, because that's, I think, 2007, 8 was the uh, Acute Care Task Force, which was a really important initiative that, that really got a lot of this moving. It was also the task force, state-led task force, on what should happen to the MHIs mm -hmm. and how many psychiatric beds we need in the state, common question. And the answer that I always gave is I can't answer that question independently. It depends on the array of services that we have. Yeah. What we all knew is that we were overly reliant on the most expensive services, emergency rooms, inpatient hospitals. Uh, that it was by default, not by design, uh, and that we needed to expand the array. And so there was leadership at the state level that sort of demanded that we do that. And the local thing, I just want to talk just a little bit about our process. Around that time, we brought in a consultant, a national consultant, and we said, okay, we need to expand the array of services and do a better job on, on crisis system. Tell us how to do it. And we got a whole bunch of people in the room from psychiatry and substance use and housing and the mental health centers and criminal justice, all aspects of law enforcement. Everybody was in the room. Tell us how to do it. He said, this is how you do it. You guys are in the room. Figure it out. On that, I can't tell you what to make it right for your community. And that was the beginning of something that we called the Johnson County System of Care Group. And we came together, most of us on our own dime, leaders of agencies across all different disciplines, on a monthly basis, sat around the table, recognized we were serving a common population, um, and, uh, you know, and, and kind of had a lot of discussions, but most importantly got each other's names in our cell phones and connect names, and, and we basically started understanding each other's worlds. And very importantly, in terms of understanding each other's worlds, got to credit Johnson County leadership. So who was the coordinator of those meetings? Jessica Peckover. Who is Jessica? She was our jail alternatives person, right? And that is the model that I think is such a great model, right? A boundary spanner, right? Most of us in mental health know how complicated the system is. We can barely negotiate it ourselves. Anyone from the outside doesn't understand it. Those of you in criminal justice know how complicated that system is. Nobody can understand it. The role of Jessica was to understand both systems, to make friends and engage people and bring those systems together. And this project from its start was a meaningful collaboration between mental health services, substance use services, law enforcement, and human services. And I think we as a community should take a tremendous amount of pride. You know, look where we are today. I, I don't want to get political here, but I can't think of a worse rallying cry than defund the police. But we, were not, we are not reacting to that. Over a decade ago, we were meaningfully linking criminal justice, law enforcement, mental health, and 
in various other support services, human services. And that's what this building is. It's the result of that meaningful collaborative vision. Now, we went places. I don't know how many people, how many people in this room went to San Antonio for a visit? We literally got on planes <laughs> and, we went and we looked at other places around the country. We went to San Antonio and Kansas and Tucson and Miami and all kinds of places. Did we replicate that model? No. We learned from those models and we said, what makes sense in this community? And we did our best to see. So that's sort of the, ha I just wanted to say that Lance is going to get the hook out any minute now. Um, One and a half minutes. Okay. Can I just say um, that I was, th I'm thrilled. Where's Director Garcia? Because I haven't met him. Hello. 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 I, I was thrilled. You know, you guys, as I understand it, you're trying to link DHS and IDPH, and you put out that RFP. Yes, sir. And when I read, the bullet points on that RFP. We worked really hard on those bullet points. Those bullet points, points are great. <laughs> and I would suggest we're like the poster child for these bullet points. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just, wanna, I just wanna read a couple of them, mm -hmm. and that'll link to a couple of things that our new medical director is gonna talk about. Mm -hmm. So these are the things that these guys are looking to do. Establish a no wrong door policy, providing comprehensive and seamless access to the array of services and supports available to those in need. Hello? Mm -hmm. Okay, no wrong door, that's where we started. Align and integrate programs, practices, and policies to improve delivery of services and most effectively leverage available funding sources. That's something we're so thrilled to work with you guys on. Identifying cross-cutting technology systems to capture client and population information across programs and other appropriate data sharing opportunities. We're struggling a bit with that. We want, we want to work on that with you. Um, align individual provider and program level licensing, certification, and accreditation reviews. Workforce is one of my big fears here. How do we get the right people in this building? Mm -hmm. I'm more interested in who they are than the initials after their name, mm -hmm. okay? And finally, identify community-based stakeholders, organizations, community members, and other stakeholders to provide input and guidance to the department's programmatic and policy efforts through opportunities for collaboration and partnership. We are really excited to be your partners in this and hope that we, you can see this as a poster child for what you're trying to do. So I'll shut up. Um, and Lance, you want me to just introduce yeah, Monica? Have, My understanding was that you guys had a specific, that you wanted us to not just celebrate with, I mainly am thrilled that we're able to celebrate. This is great. You should be celebrating. <laughs> we should be. And should it's be fantastic. A yeah. lot of work went into yeah. this. Um, but also, we were, we were told that, that we, we sort of wanted this to be a beginning of a conversation. Um, and so I want to introduce uh, the next generation who's going to sort of carry the baton here. Monica Jindal is someone that was duly trained in family medicine and psychiatry. So talk about integrated care. She is our new medical director. And um, I think she's going to just um, maybe give a few examples of how some of those bullet points speak directly to us and how we might go forward in conversation about those. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you, Dr. Flom, for that introduction. I'm just so grateful to be able to be here not only speaking to everyone, but being able to also celebrate how much really went into this. I am you know, have only been involved within the last year. Um, but with that, I again want to see this vision that these trailblazers really worked on come to fruition. And I think some of the things that we kind of envision to make that successful, for me, kind of, surround, kind of center themselves around three main areas. One is certainly financial viability. I think it's really hard to, you know, it's a little bit of the elephant in the room, but it's the conversation that we need to have about how are we going to make this financially sustainable. The second piece that Dr. Flom already hit on is workforce uh, sustainability and, and recruiting and maintaining a high quality workforce. And then the third part, which I think is what we're all here for, is access to services through integration of care. As Dr. Flom mentioned, I'm trained in family medicine and psychiatry. Integrating care, innovative care models, and really meeting people where they are is my passion. That's what's brought me here. That's what um, most people don't know this story, but I came from Denver, Colorado back to Iowa um, to be able to take 
on a project like this because I was interested in what innovative work it really is. And really, again, this community development and community organization. So first, kind of speaking to financial sustainability and viability, I think you know that's one area where we certainly can use some state support and some state advocacy even to leverage existing funding sources. One example of that is the Certified Community Behavioral Health Center model um, where we could potentially receive that designation as an integrated care center. Um, that could be one way of providing additional, um, additional funding and have an additional funding stream. Um, one thing to keep in mind is because we're this innovative model, our, um, our revenue is not going to support all of our costs because of the way the current um, billing structures are. We kind of like to say we're not inpatient, we're not outpatient. We're this in the middle thing that really hasn't been defined yet. Um, one thing that you know we've been kind of coming against as we work with insurance companies, and, and Lance certainly has done much more with that, is that the IME code hasn't been updated since 2018, so it doesn't include anything about access centers. It doesn't include anything about this innovative care model that we're trying to execute. Um, when we talk to them, they're excited. They see this as an emerging area, but just really need further guidance on what to do next, how to incorporate it. And once we can improve some of those connections with both IME and ultimately MCOs as well, the managed care organizations, um, you know, hopefully we can align more closely to work together when there are inevitable things that come up, like billing delays, um, like process improvement that we all need to be doing. And so that's, that's just kind of one example, too, of a way that we can um, improve some of our financial um, viability and the finances of, of a place like this. Um, workforce development is another big one. I should mention, I'm going to briefly hit on a few things. There are certainly people that have been working on these things for a long time, so if there are certain areas you'd like to discuss further, please bring those up and we'll have other experts in the room chime in as well um, if they have more to say. So moving on to, like I said, workforce, sustaining a high quality workforce. I think the two areas that I really kind of wrap my brain around. One is thinking about workforce burnout. We know healthcare workers get easily burned out. Um, and that's healthcare workers across the board. You know, I'm not talking just provider physician level, but that's nurses, that's even, you know, various techs that we have in a building like this. Particularly when you're considering working with the patient population that we're working with. It's a challenging patient population. It is. We've all been called to do this work and the people that we hire are motivated to do this work, but it's often um, challenging to retain a high quality workforce when we can't compensate in the way that, or provide a compensation package that is comparable to what other healthcare institutions in the area are able to do. And so that makes it very hard to be able to recruit for, um, for that high quality workforce. Another really tangible example is um, the requirement to have registered nurses or RNs um, provide some of our services. If we were able to have some changes or flexibility within some of the rules and regulations to allow, for example, LPNs, that might give us a little bit more flexibility with hiring. I, I see lots of nodding. So there, again, are other experts in the room here that can speak to that and their own experiences with that and in terms of trying to hire and retain staff. Um, it, for, for again an innovative project like this um, and, and I think the thing that I'll, I'll kind of point out is we're asking this staff to be very nimble. We're asking them to exist in a space that's doing mental health care in, in addition to substance abuse care. That's a really specialized skill set that we're asking them to have and we're asking them to transition back and forth and that's all as someone that does it I can tell you that's a lot mm -hmm. and so we really should be recognizing that our workforce is has this kind of extra skill set and this extra training that we're asking of them and really should be providing them um, the resources to make sure that they're able to do to to, to perform their job and, and recognizing the value that they're bringing um, another area is again one huge interest of mine which is um, oh sorry one other piece in terms of workforce burnout that I was about to forget a lot of what contributes to healthcare workers' uh, burnout uh, has to do with documentation requirements and bureaucracy requirements. 
again, I see the providers in the room all nodding. They all know. Um, so when we have to fill out things like prior authorizations that potentially take two days to figure out whether or not someone can receive access to care, that is cumbersome and burdensome, particularly for something like this where we're trying to meet people where they are. We're trying to provide them immediate access to care to meet the crisis needs that they have in the moment. When we're not sure whether it's going to be covered by insurance or we're not sure what service we can provide or what the bill is going to be later, it makes it very complicated for us to be able to do our jobs and take care of the whole person in the way that we want to. Another really key piece of that is also documentation. When we have burdensome documentation for the sake of billing, for the sake of insurance companies, that's another kind of dissatisfier, if you will, that contributes to burnout. I will say, in this building currently, because of the way that we are bringing together these organizations, we are, I think, at last count, going to have four different electronic medical records from each organization. Which, yep, I now see all the eyes bugging out of how is that going to work? Um, and we have been navigating that since day one. Um, and so if there would be some, my, my one ask I would have certainly from the state would be if there is some way that we could um, subsidize a single EHR or if there is an EHR we could potentially have access to or some sort of database to bring some of these metrics together. Again, going with one of the bullet points of leveraging technology so that we can provide, so we can track and data collect and be able to really provide good access to care. That would be a huge one for us that we've been really struggling with navigating. So that's another, again, really tangible example of something that would be helpful when we think about innovative models like this. Lastly, am I getting the hook yet? Yes, I'm you're almost. Close? All right. Then, well, I kept my most important one for last, but hopefully it'll generate more discussion. <laughs> Um, which is regarding access to care and integration of services. So I've hit on a few of them in terms of working with IME, in terms of having a seamless EHR to help with that. One that also is important is kind of recognizing where some of the existing protocols maybe don't fit within this model. And so one example of that is Johnson County Ambulance right now is only able to transport folks to the emergency room. They're not able to transport folks, folks to somewhere like Guideline Center. So having the ability to change some of those protocols if we're going to divert from the emergency room and be able to bring people here instead, we need a change in that protocol to allow for that, to allow them, so to allow the ambulance to bring people here instead. And so, or conversely, to transport port even from the emergency room to here, as another example. And so that's a really tangible example of where some of these changes need to occur so that we can allow kind of the innovation that's happening here to happen so we can take care of the whole person. I'll go with my last one in this kind of segue, it brings everything together a little bit. Right now, uh, mental health services are seen as separate. It's seen as behavioral health and it's seen as substance use disorder services. And so when IME is trying to ask us what percentage is gonna be this and what percentage is gonna be that, that's kind of another component that's really not integrated. You know, That's not thinking about the whole person and how are we gonna take care of this person as they are as a single person, rather than, oh, your behavioral health, oh, your substance use, oh, you're this, oh, you have the, a little bit of this and a lot of that. Um, and just thinking about them as one whole person and utilizing something like this in the way that we're able to integrate services, allow for this improved access to really make sure that we're taking care of the whole person. And so I think that's what it comes down to with all of these points is how do we take care of the whole person? And the things that we need to do to be most successful at that are to ensure our financial viability, make sure that we have a high quality workforce, and make sure that we have good integration of services. All of these organizations are doing what they do well. Co-locating under one roof isn't the only thing that needs to happen. We need to have appropriate communication and seamless transitions between these services. And those are some of the things that I think will help us get there. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to be here and tour. This is incredible, the collaboration and the partnership. And I know we often, and it's been just uh, really become evident even through this last year with COVID, the silos that we have in place and what I've seen transpire just over this last year on bringing people together, coordination, collaboration to serve Iowans holistically has just been incredible. And so, um, it, you know, when we did the mental health um, reform that we worked on together and we worked on together to put the children's mental health system together, um, Access Centers was one of the big pieces of that legislation and to have six in the state of Iowa, we have four, you make five, we have one more coming on I think 
um, soon, is just incredible to see that actually happen and how we can take this and really build on it. I live in Osceola. We have one of them there. I was listening to Dr. Gers or Director Dar Garcia talk about some of the things that they've learned from the rollout of theirs that could be beneficial to what you all are doing. Uh, I love the fact that you're um, open and, and excited to bring other communities in to see what you're doing so we can take this concept and continue to build on it. Uh, I tried to take really good notes, but I know without even hesitation, Kelly will be back here and will be coordinating because we want to do it too. I want to streamline services. We want to, you know, every time we're not doing that, it's a duplication of cost and we're not as effective or efficient as we can be and that impacts the number of people that we can serve. So, um, I mean, you just ticked off everything I think we're working on all the time, whether it's workforce or uh, streamlining bureaucracy or figuring out ways that we can address. We've been talking about um, prior authorization for a long time and how we deal with that and streamline that. Uh, the EHR, um, that's something else we've been trying to figure out how we can work through that. I mean, these are things that are on the table and we've been trying to come to some consensus. So now you're going to push us a little bit further to help us uh, maybe refocus and redouble down our efforts to address uh, some of the things that you talked about. But when we walked in, I think you talked about this is a behavioral health urgent care facility that's really put in place to really take care of the whole person. And um, it's just, it's what we need to do. It's the right thing to do for so many, many, many reasons. So um, we look forward to being a partner. Thanks for being a leader and really stepping out and investing the time to do it right um, and to be willing to learn and to adjust and adapt going forward and to help kind of bring us along to be a part of that. We all have a role to play. Um, so we look forward to, you know, coming back and working and seeing how we can build out other facilities just like this. But just, I know it's just the beginning and I understand where you're coming from from that perspective, but this really should be a big celebration because this is incredible and it is a true role model uh, for other areas of the state and region to take a look at and build, build off of. So, well, well done. And I can tell the pride. Kelly, or Mr. My name is Adam Gregg. I'm very honored to serve as the Lieutenant Governor. Uh, before I was serving as Lieutenant Governor, however, I served as the State Public Defender. And so just one quick comment. I really appreciate the connections here between uh, law enforcement and the criminal justice system as well, because there are so many situations where people in crisis get entangled in the criminal justice system, and that may not be the best place right. for them for a lot of different reasons. And so I appreciate the fact that that has been an underlying assumption behind this center and really want to applaud you for, for the work that you're doing there because I think it gets the right help in the right places and better aligns our resources. And so just want to applaud you for that. The jail diversion piece of it is so important. Director? So I'm, I'm Kelly Garcia. I'm the director of the Department of Human Services and the interim director of the Department of, health, of Public Health. And that is a role that the governor asked me to serve in. Um, and really because my work is focused on program alignment. So you're out here doing the work. My job is to work on aligning to make it easier for you to do your job. And that's true for the staff in my facilities. We have six of them. We're a part of their array of services too. Uh, but the bigger concept here and the work that I spent uh, most of my career in Texas doing is really to, to try to mimic that at the state level, Stream, better streamlining, I came, I came here and said, show me behavioral health. And they said, it's here and here. And we don't have a unified vision. We don't really have a focus on behavioral health in the state. We're going to. That's what the RFP is working on. That's what and, I asked her to do when she came back. It's that's like, exactly we've got to bring the two agencies together. We just have to do this. And that's, so. and that's tricky. And we will work through some places because what we don't want to do is break things, right? And I know there are fears about moving, aligning things with the Medicaid program. Uh, but Medicaid is the backbone of services. You talked about it about seven times in your report. Did your, you notice that? Yeah, I did. <laughs> I did. And we have a lot of work to do there, too. The great news is we're in a stable place to do that work. So now is the real fun part of the work that we can do. And, and, and much like, you know, the, what you're, you're, we're all called to this work, I think. We wouldn't be in these jobs if we weren't. For me, um, so much of what you said resonated with me. But for me... My, my goal is much, it's driven out of, of being a parent, right? Is how do, you, how do you meet someone, a young mom, where she is, 
How do you align those services so that you support her to live her best life and ultimately her children as well? Um, and, and so here, this is, that, this is that concept, this is that model live. And I was here about a year ago um, when it was, it was bones, but it was still just <laughs> conceptual. And so to be here today is a distinct honor. I'm excited to partner with you. Everything that you touched on is very much in the works. So I'm gonna ask you to come join us at the table yeah. and work through the technical detail. Thank you for having me here today.